Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Hazara Black Day commemoration event. My name is Nazneen Sharifi, and I'm an executive here at the Sydney University Afghan Society, and I'm also part of Sabah Group. I'll be one of your co-hosts this evening, facilitating the panel discussion. So to get us started, I'd like to welcome uh, Mohammed Gulzari, uh, who is an independent researcher in history, politics, and the culture of the Indian subcontinent and Afghanistan. He is a member of the Royal Society of Asian Affairs in London. Mr. Gulzari has conducted extensive research from the Hazara persecution between the 1880s and the 1990s and has collated important documents from the British archives on, his, on this historical period. He is also a TV, TV presenter and a journalist. Thank you so much, Mr. Gulzari, for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure to have you here. And to just to get the conversation started, I just wanted to ask you about some historical analysis of the Hazara genocide. Thank you very much, everybody, and particularly the distinguished guest. Uh, and uh, let me thank, for, first of all, the Sabah team and the Sydney University for organizing such an important event. So <clears throat> let's go to the topic. Uh, today, uh, honestly, is uh, really the, uh, we can call it uh, Black Day. Black Day in the sense of that uh, today, from all over Afghanistan, from all um, uh, communities, uh, like uh, every other communities in Afghanistan, they were all swarmed and uh, surrounded Uruzgan, and by today, 25th September, the, the generals and the soldiers and regular and uh, tribal forces, all combined forces entered Uruzgan. This is the event which has been recorded uh, very clearly and very loudly by Faiz Muhammad Khatib in his famous book, Siraj Tawarikh, the volume three. So <clears throat> there are a lots of other uh, evidence as well, like uh, in the British uh, confidential uh, declassified documents, and you can call it sometime uh, uh, British confidential prints. So, but uh, after all, these these deaths are to some extent is con contradicts with each other. Uh, <clears throat> 25th September 1892 is the beginning of the atrocities and genocide committed by the state of Afghanistan against uh, the Hazaras. One of the, <clears throat> one of the major ethnic and religious section of Afghanistan in the last decades of the 19th century. After the fall of Uruzgan on 25th September 1892, the resistance of the Hazara people was weakened. And by the end of September 1893, the resistance was completely quelled or crushed. The whole of Hazaristan came under the control of Amir Abdurrahman Khan. During and after the occupation of Hazaristan, atrocities, mass killings, confiscation of land, forced migration and slavery were continued till the end of the Amir Abdurrahman Khan's rule in 1901. After the death of Amir, Amir Abdurrahman Khan, Hazara persecution has continued throughout his rule till 1919. However, in this period of time, the nature of persecution was changed. Even it was uh, <clears throat> the persecution during the, uh, the reign of Amir Habibullah, the nature was slightly changed, but then the mass killing was at least it was stopped. And some notification or proclamation has been issued by Amir Habibullah Khan to the Hazaras that they uh, they are uh, asked to come back to the country and he is willing to give them, compensate the land which has been given to the Afghans by his father. In one statement, uh, Amir Habibullah Khan, when he came on throne, he said in Urdu, because you might know that Habibullah Khan was speaking very good Urdu as well. He said, Merabab Buratha. So this is a short statement he has recorded by the British uh, mm, News, news writer in Kabul. The historical evidence shows that the Mir Abdurrahman Khan had intentionally and willingly planned and carried out genocide against the Shia Hazaras. In September 1880, for the first time, we see that in September 1880, the Times of London has raised alarm regarding the, accept, uh, the expected revolt of Shias with the support of the Hazaras. It states that 
if the Qizilbashis of Kabul revolt, it may be noted that if they were to rise the standard of revolt, they would probably find powerful allies in the Hazaras who like themselves are Shias. During the reign of Amir Abdurrahman Khan, other Afghans who revolted were severely punished, for example, Shinwaris and the people of Turkestan, etc. But the Hazaras were treated with extreme cruelty and humiliation. humiliation. Historical evidence shows that the Hazaras and the Afghans of Kandahar were in a very friendly terms before Abdurrahman Khan. During the Ghalzai revolt in 1887, against the Amir Abdurrahman Khan, Hazaras of Jaghuri had joined them. On one occasion, the Ghilzais has sent their wife, women, and children in the protection of Hazaras. That is really very rare examples that we have seen in this, uh, in this century or after the Amir Abdurrahman Khan, because the Nang, Namus, and Ghairat, these terms in Afghanistan are very, have a great value because it has never been heard. Maybe rarely you have heard that the, the Pashtuns have sent their wives in the protection of Hazaras. <clears throat> but it happened, it was happened before the Hazara war, which shows, I mean, these shows that the harmony between the Afghans and the Hazaras during the height of the Hazara was it, in August 1892, the Achekzais, Duranis, and the people of Maruf and Salisun strongly objected to helping the Amir against the Hazaras. They denied and they did not go on war. Those who did not want to go to Orozgan expedition or deserted from the battle were punished with extreme cruelty by the Amir. For example, the Uzbek of Maimana, who also opposed uh, joining the expedition against Hazaras, they were all treated very badly. <coughs> About 4,000 of the Uzbeks at that time, they immigrated to Russia which created a very serious political row between Afghanistan and Russia. The Shia of Kandahar and Herat had also been persecuted. In many cases, the men and the women of Kandahar were severely punished being supported the Hazaras, particularly relatives of Mirza Muhammad Taqi Khan, the British news writer in Herat and Kandahar, who were tortured and their property were confiscated. The coexistence and harmony between the Afghan and Hazara were ruined after full-fledged war against Hazaras was declared. Particularly using the religious card or declaring Shia Hazaras as, as infidels had severely damaged Afghanistan society. The religious hatred and racial discrimination against Shias and Hazaras led by Amir Abdurrahman Khan are continued till today. Here are some examples of the various fatwas, notifications, and letters issued by the Afghan authorities and mullahs against the Shias and Hazaras. For your information, viewers, distinguished guests, my all these information I'm giving are all uh, extracted or accumulated from the uh, archival documents which has rarely seen or published by the archive department, as not only from the British archives, but from the private archives and um, libraries uh, in uh, Balochistan. Uh, Pakistan and India. So these are quite useful information for uh, young scholars, particularly. Uh, the one of the examples of that notification is by the says by by the sixth of August, eighteen ninety two. It was the height of the Hazara War. Two hundred notification and letters have been received from Kabul by the mullahs and preachers of Kandahar. It states that these wordings are very very important. You can find the what sort of intention Amir Abdurrahman Khan had to uh, exterminate the Hazaras. Under the circumstances, it is proper for a wise king to warn those of his subject who have gone astray and to induce them by way of advice and exhortation to abandon the false faith and follow the true path of Islam. If their in infidelity is due to their ignorance, they ought to grasp the true facts of true religion. After this, they will remain happy. But if they persist in their false faith, they should be put to death. It means they, they, this faith was exactly against the Hazaras, which has been uh, circulated. And their property confiscated in accordance with the divine doctrine and the precepts of the Prophet. Amir again says, I have therefore with a view to bringing this astral flock to that true faith, ordered that 
they should be preached to and exhorted to give up their false religion. It means Hazaras must give up their religion, Shia faith. If they do not listen to the advice and preaching of the Sunnis, it would be absolutely necessary that they should be put to death. Those Sunnis who will not act willingly in this matter will also be counted infidels. We have seen that ample evidence that those tribes who, who opposed Amir Abdurrahman Khan going against the Hazaras, so they were all treated extremely with cruelty. Amir further says, all mullahs in position of these notifications should keep them carefully and in order that the, the paper on which they are written should not be easily torn or destroyed. A piece of cloth should be affixed to the back of it to prevent its easily worn it. I believe still some of the, the copy, copies of that notification are kept with the, some of the Afghan tribes today even. By 20th August 1892, Amir writes to the governor of Kandahar, General Abdullah Khan Taimani, I have written to you to make you aware that the evil disposed people of Maimana have received a well-merited punish, punishment if God pleases. The infidel and traitor Hazaras will also soon be extirpated. And by the blessings of the true faith, the turbulent and rebellious will be disgraced and annihilated. By August 1892, in a conversation with a British agent at Kabul, Amir has clearly said he has issued a proclamation declaring the Shias to be kafir, infidels. By 2nd July 1892, Amir has addressed the Durrani tribal leaders that my object in conquering Urizgan is merely to secure a strong and naturally fortified position for you Duranis. For I observed that you are subject to ag aggressions from the infidels, Hazaras on both sides. If you are asleep, you must wake up. Amir further added, he has ordered 100,000 men consisting both regular and tribal levies to be sent against the Urzgan River. Later on, huge number of the regular and tribal forces were collected with fully equipped modern arms, including 2,000 cannonballs and 40 months of hashish chairs for the entertainment of the soldiers because the majority of the soldiers were addicted of the hashish and the drugs. These tribal forces swarmed on Orizgan and ruined village after village, destroyed every living thing, including trees and vegetations. Only in the valley of Hujristan in Orizgan, 100,000 standing trees were cut down. Each tree was worth of 5 to 10 Afghani rupees at the time. After declaring the Shia Hazar infidel, the holy war against the Hazara started Hazaras could not stand against the cannon and other modern weaponry of Afghans and started retreating in the mountains. The machine khana or the munition workshop, the arsenal workshop, was therefore ordered to work 24 hours. After strong resistance showed by Hazara, eventually the Hazaras could not resist longer against Amir's superior armed center of resistance. Orozgan eventually fell in the hands of Amir's soldiers. By September 25th, 1892, the victorious Afghan forces entered Urzgan and the Hazaras fled to the mountains. In, the, in that period of time, the Urzgan was surrounded. General Abdullah Khan, the governor of Kandahar, assured the Hazaras that their lives and property would be safe if they come in and make terms, sending a seal Quran. The Hazaras chief trusted Abdullah Khan and came down accordingly with about 600 men. But no sooner had the Hazaras come in than a signal for slaughter was made by General Abdullah Khan. Except for one chief and his family, all the 600 Hazaras were put to the sword. Earlier in the month of July, horrifying acts of atrocities and cruelty took place. On 24th July 1892, equivalent to the 11th Muharram, which is considered one of the sacred months uh, among the Shia. In the Kimsan village or in the Kimsan valley of Orizgan, only uh, in the Kimsan only, Hundreds of Hazaras were killed and their heads were cut off and these heads were placed on spears and taken round the Kandahar Bazaar. Afterwards, 
or a pillar was erected and these hats were displayed upon it. These atrocities were continued and thousands of women, children and women were captured as prisoners of war. Men were killed, women and children and girls were sold out in an open market of the major cities of Afghanistan. Each woman, girls and children were sold at the price of 20 to 50 rupees each according to their age. Several hundreds were sold in the Russian territories and in the Indian towns and cities, even to the non-Muslims. Many Hazaras women were converted into Hindu religion in Kandahar only. After the defeat of the Hazaras, their lands and properties were distributed among the Afghans of the mainland and even the Afghans from the Indian territory. According to the Faiz Muhammad Khatib, about 400,000 Hazara families were either killed, imprisoned, sold as a slave, and emigrated forcefully to the neighboring countries during the period of 1896 to 1925. If we take 6% in a family, so the 4,000 family, it makes about 2.4 million people. According to the British agent in Herat, in one week, about 4,000 4, Hazaras were trying to flee to Russia. At the same time, thousands of the Hazaras fled to Persia via Herat. Hence, thousands of Hazaras have forcefully emigrated the Indian, Russia, and Persian territories. During this period of time, 1,500 Hazara women and girls were said to have been carried off and brutally ill-treated by the Amir soldier. The Hazara war has also affected the political ambitions of the Amir as a well-created concern for the European analyst as well. This is a very important area which I'm talking now. Amir had planned to visit London, seeking a direct relationship with the London rather than through the Viceroy of India. Due to the Hazara resistance, Amir abandoned this London trip which embarrassed Amir Abdurrahman Khan very badly. And even if we uh, see the very famous uh, article of uh, Jonathan Lee on the Amir al-Mulk Amir Abdurrahman Khan, then we see then how the Hazara was affected the, the health of Amir Abdurrahman Khan as well. An arm embargo imposed during that period of time by the Indian government affected Amir's advancement. Hazara took advantage of that opportunity and made considerable success over the Afghans. It was a time when the first, for the first time, Hazara united and defeated the Afghans on various fronts. The dilatory tactics of a postponement of the Durand mission, which later on we call the Durand line, which has created by this mission. The Durand mission further intensified the relationship between Amir and the British authorities, particularly the Viceroy of India of that time. Amir has given the Hazara war the main reason for the postponement postponement of the mission. The defeat of Afghan forces in mid-1892 further embarrassed Amir, which had been discussed in the international arena. The news of the defeat and desertion of the tribal forces has been reflected widely in the British newspapers. About 23 national and regional newspapers have widely reported Hazara war, particularly by July 1892. Particularly by the July 1892, the defection of the Afghan forces and victory of Hazaras over Afghans were reported. Some newspapers have also reported the defection of the Sardar Abdul Quddus Khan as well, the, his uh, as sort of commander in chief in that time. Major General James Brown, the agent to the Governor General in Balochistan, has reported on this matter that the Sardar Abdul Quddus Khan is apparently playing a double game and there is a strong feeling in the country that he is backing up the Hazara secretly. These are all speculation, actually. The Times of London reports about the incompetence of Afghan generals and states that the Hazara's rebellion is assuming more formidable proportions so far as can be judged from the vague reports which have been reached this country. The Afghan generals are displaying extraordinary incompetence. Last week, they allowed two convoys to fall victims of cleverly planned ambuscades. And the result is that the rebels are now well supplied with what they formerly most wanted, Snyder's rifles and ammunition. On July the 6th, 1892, the Times further writes that the, a new development has taken place in connection with the Hazara rising in Sundal, Afghanistan. The Amir has tried to patch up a friendly state settlement with the Orzgan Hazara, but has failed. The rebellion is now spreading among the Hazara generally on a large scale. The time further reported by the 
August 1892, the Times of London has published an interesting article written by Professor Arminus Vambre, a Hungarian Orientalist who traveled Afghanistan uh, in that period of time on the Afghan situation under the subject of Hazara rising a serious matter. That is really worth to read in these days so we can understand how the Hazara war was has been analyzed in Europe and in, in England and other countries in Europe. Professor Wambre characterizes the rising of the Hazaras against the Amir as serious and as the troops of the latter have already received a severe check. The result of the instructions is difficult to foretell. He ascribes the causes of the rebellion to Russian machinations and even mentioned the probability of the insurgents having been secretly furnished with Russian weaponry. These are all a great, I mean, a speculation or rumors were uh, going around in India, even in, in Britain and Europe, that there might be Russians are involved in that provocation or in the, in the Hazara uh, to in, instigate the Hazaras to revolt against Amir. It was assumed by the British and authorities and the Russians are instigating the Hazaras against Amir Abdurrahman Khan. These speculations were widely discussed and exploited by the Amir Abdurrahman Khan and other concerned parties. By April 1894, these speculations of foreign involvement in Hazara rebellion against Amir were diffused by Major General James Brown, interviewing a Hazara chief of Orozgan, Mir Hussein Beg, who secretly fled from Hazaristan to and reached Quetta. Mr. Brown writes, the statement seems to me to be a plain and unvarnished account of the recent Hazara war derived from what appears to be very reliable sources. It appears valuable as establishing the fact that there was no sort of foreign interference in the war, but it was merely a struggle between His Highness the Amir and Hazaras, which terminated apparently in the complete subjection of the later. So there's a lots of things to say, but I think my time is already uh, come to the end. But uh, if I don't have any time so I stop here but still there is a lots of thing to say but at the last I will say a few words about the important events of that time that the Amir of the Raman Khan has also blamed the Mujtahid of Mashad in Persia that they are also supporting the Hazara cause and that's why he Amir said I'm rightful and lawful to punish the Hazaras and that's why the, all these atrocities are committed by Amir of the Raman Khan the Shia Mujtahid led by the Sheikh Muhammad Taqi Bijnurdi played a vital role and he also written uh, many letters to the Shah of Persia Nasiruddin Shahi Qajar to stop this Hazara genocide and Shia killings in Afghanistan. But during this conversation between Persia, Afghanistan and Indian and British authorities, about 13 very important enclosures has been exchanged and what policy was had been adopted by the British, uh, Persian and the Afghan governments. And at the last, you see these piece of information which has been uh, accumulated from the different archives. These are the petitions of the women slaves who were sold in India. They launched petition to the government at Indian authorities. They are requesting to free them from the slavery because they are Shia, still Shia, and they are very different from the other people, uh, from their masters. They were sold. Thank you very much for listening for your patience. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Gulzari. We are so thankful and we will continue this conversation as part of our Q&A. Uh, our next speaker for the evening is Dr. Nematullah Ibrahimi. Dr. Nematullah is a lecturer in international relations at La Trobe University. He teaches subjects on Middle Eastern politics, international organizations, and security. His research interests include political violence, peace building, post-conflict political borders, social movements, and contentious politics. Dr. Ibrahimi completed his PhD in 2018 at the Australian National University, where his doctoral research examined the dynamics of contentious politics in the context of post-2001 international intervention in Afghanistan. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahimi, for joining us this evening. You've done quite an extensive amount of research in the areas of foreign intervention within Afghanistan. I just wanted to ask you, has this international interventions, foreign policy and geopolitical te 
tensions exasperated the situation for the Hazara people and how interventions have created or facilitated the space for further ethnic cleansing and genocidal ideologies. Uh, thank you, Naz. Uh, thank you, other uh, distinguished speakers. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. I think this is quite an important event to be organized under the present circumstances with the unfolding tragedy in Afghanistan, which has placed the Hazaras once again in a very precarious situation, both politically, culturally, but also in terms of their security conditions in Afghanistan. I think I would also like to thank uh, the work of uh, uh, Mr. Gulzari for all the work he has been doing. And uh, with regards to the question you raised for me, I think before I come to that question, I would like to make a couple of quick general points about the 1890s as well. Uh, I wouldn't go into details of what happened. I think Mr. Gulzari uh, laid out uh, uh, the broader uh, historical context in which the Hazara War took place. And he also shared some really uh, important details that offer important insights into some of the details of what happened to the Hazaras during those years. I would like to maybe make a couple of quick points about why we discovered the genocide. Uh, in my book, The Hazaras in the Afghan State, I have tried to um, offer a description of the 1891 to 1893, specifically as a genocide. Uh, in that book, my definition is really a basic one, drawing from the work of Raphael Lemkin, the Polish scholar and legal scholar and activist, who really was a force behind the 1948 uh, UN Convention on the Prevention of Genocide. So the basic idea here is, you know, genocide, according to that you know, initial proposition by Raphael Lemkin, is the destruction of the national pattern of the oppressed and the reimposition of the national pattern of the oppressor. So this is, I think, what happened in Afghanistan uh, to the Hazaras from 1891 to 1893 in particular. However, I think there are you know, different uh, interpretations of what the genocide means. There is a legal definition, which is included in uh, 1948 uh, UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. And there's also a more recent uh, definition of the genocide in the room statute of the, uh, of the International Criminal Court, uh, the statute of 1998. So I wouldn't go into details of that. So the basic idea, definition behind the definition of a genocide is that there are a series of acts that are perpetrated with the intention to destroy a national, ethnical, religious group in whole or in part. So this is quite an important one, you know, in a series of acts that are committed with the intention. So I think in the recent years, there have been a series of claims made by the Hazaras and other human rights group calling for attention that Hazaras are at risk of genocide. There are a number of different historical events that have been used as an example for that. Uh, 1891 to 1893 is one, and more recent years, that a series of targeted attacks against the Hazaras in Quetta, Pakistan, was one when Hazaras started using the term genocide to describe the situation they were in. And then in more recent years in Kabul, in Afghanistan, we have also seen a series of uh, targeted attacks directed towards the Hazara villages of worship, cultural centers, uh, you know, commercial centers, uh, political figures, journalists, and others. So this is this are the context in which the Hazaras have called for the international community to recognize the threat of genocide against the Hazaras. So now, how do we understand genocide? You know, that is maybe an opening for me also to come to the question you posed for me, Naz, about the past 20 years of international intervention in Afghanistan. I think there are two different senses, ways in which we understand, we can understand the term genocide. One is genocide as an event, uh, you know, a series of acts that are perpetrated with the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part. I think that is an important one. Uh, in the legal definition, it doesn't uh, mean that a group has to be destroyed before an event can be called a genocide. The intention is quite an important one here. And the second sense in which the word genocide, the term genocide can be used is also as a process. Here, we do not look at one single event or a series of events that are happening over a specific period of time. Let's take the example of 
1891 to 1893. During those three years, we see all of those key elements of the definition of genocide being perpetrated you know, by Amir Abdul Rahman Khan and the groups he mobilized on the Hazaras. And now we should see genocide as a series of processes, a series of acts uh, that, that you know, take place over a period of time that results to that partial or complete destruction of a group. So here, there are a number of different ways. I mean, you can look at one is, for example, drawing on the work of Gregory Santan. There, is, there are eight stages you know, of why, uh, of how a genocide happens. Uh, I wouldn't go into details of this um, for people who are interested. The just such you can find the are different uh, and it is easily available. You know, this includes, for example, classification, symbolization, dehumanization, organization, polarization, preparation, extermination, and denial. So all of these acts, you know, happen in different phases. The genocide is a really a horrible event that doesn't play, take place over time. It has to take place in a specific political, social, and security context. And for that to happen, there are a series of other warning signs that we can see that eventually will lead to those sort of attempts uh, to exterminate a group, to destroy a group in whole or in part. We can also look at it, there are other scholars who have been looking at a sort of more long-term historical process. Here, I'm specifically referring to the work of Sherry Rosenberg in an article she published in the Journal of uh, Genocide Prevention in 2012. There, she is looking at different cases, calling for you know, a more broader definition of genocide as a, as a process. One of the central concepts she uses is the genocide by attrition. Quite an important one, I think, here. So you don't, you know, a group doesn't have to be directly killed, eliminated, exterminated by uh, a military force uh, of, a, of a state. Uh, they can also be subjected to genocide if they are placed in conditions indirectly where they are in physical or mental conditions that will amount to their partial or complete destruction as a group. Here, you can uh, look at the disease, starvation, uh, you, know, you know, more recently, the history of Afghanistan, I think if you look at the period of uh, the Taliban from 1896 to uh, 2001, you can look at two different incidents. One is the August 1998, when the Taliban went on a campaign of killing mainly Hazara civilians of Mazar Sharif, you know, with a clear, really pronounced intent to punish the Hazaras as a group. And then, you know, another aspect of this we can often forget is the economic blockade in, in 1997, 1998, that the Taliban imposed on Hazarajan. This is uh, for those of us, I, mean, I was living in Hazarajan at that time, and you know, I remember how the sort of economic conditions in which the Hazaras were placed were also uh, amounting to a you know, serious degradation of the Hazaras to live as a group. And you can see, you know, the effect of this targeted killings on the Hazaras in, uh, in, in Poita, I think you know, the way uh, the Hazaras have been pushed into these two uh, enclaves within the city of Poita, I think is also one in which you can see that there are warning signs of a genocide here. So I think this is, uh, you know, a, a sort of a broad uh, description of some of these two processes. You can see genocide as an event, and genocide as a process. And genocide as a process may consist of a series of events which directly or indirectly create conditions uh, for the destruction, uh, partial or complete destruction of a group. Okay. So now, just a quick point on the question you uh, posed for me. I think over the past 20 years, the Hazaras had really placed their faith in the new political process that was set up by the international community uh, following the Bonn uh, Agreement of 2001. Uh, the Hazaras for the first time found uh, in a relative space in which they could express themselves politically, uh, culturally, they found avenues in civil society, media, culture, and education. And some of those gains uh, have also been made possible you know, as a result of international intervention, but there were others, I think, that are made possible as a result of the work and creativity 
uh, and hard work of the Hazaras themselves. Uh, uh, you can see many incidents of a uh, you know, really uh, good level of activism across the Pakistan among the Hazaras over the past two decades that had nothing to do with the international intervention. Hazaras is given that opportunity in the making of a space for themselves to participate in the new life of Afghanistan. And now, you know, after 20 years, uh, you know, we see all of those gains are at risk. I mean, not at risk, but I mean, in, in, in a lot of those doors, avenues, spaces have closed to the Hazaras. The Hazaras are you know, under the new Taliban government. And, you know, this is maybe something we can come back in a moment and have no way to uh, feel represented in this new arrangement uh, of Islamic Emirate, as they call it, uh, uh, they, have, they have established in Afghanistan. So I think, sum it up, uh, I think, there are this sort of broad historical forces that are at play in Afghanistan. I think you know, some of those sort of dynamics are back uh, locally. Uh, if you look at the Hazara situation now in many parts of Afghanistan, and Hazara in particular, this is a complete reversal of the Hazaras going back to the pre 1980s. Uh, you know, in a subjugation of one group by other group, you know, primarily. Uh, the Taliban, uh, who are predominantly Pashtun, uh, uh, you know, seizing uh, political control over the life of the Hazaras, uh, uh, not only in Kabul, but also across Hazar region. Uh, so these are, I think, you know, some really concerning signs. We are already receiving reports of mass displacement of Hazaras in Daikundi, um, and the return of Pashtun nomads in many parts of uh, Hazar region. I think uh, these are uh, all uh, you know, issues for us to reflect on. Um, they are so all causes for concern. I should probably stop here um, in, in the interest of time, but I would be happy to come back to some of these questions in, during the Q&A. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Ibrahimi, for that very extensive elaboration on the different uh, facets of why Hazaras uh, you know, being ethnically cleansed. I think you've, you've pointed out a really important point that genocide isn't a singular event. It happens over time and it is a process. And it is a process that has been happening to Hazaras for the past 130 years. And with the emergence of the Taliban regime, we are at a very imminent stage of history where Hazaras continue to face this fear of genocide. And like you mentioned, in places like Daikundi, they are being ethnically cleansed, displaced from their, their land and their homes. Our next speaker is Dr. Melissa Shabanda. She's an assistant professor of anthropology at Zayed University in Abu Dhabi. She's currently conducting a research project with Afghan refugees in Athens, Greece, and continuing research on Hazara civil society, activists and advocates in Bamiyan and Kabul, Afghanistan. She has conducted research on Afghan women and Hazara ethnic identity and has visited Afghanistan many times as part of her research projects. I wanted to firstly thank you for being here, but also you've done quite an extensive amount of research in the field of anthropology and studying civil society within Afghanistan, especially of the Hazara people. I wanted to ask you what impact do these events have on the collective psyche and collective and cultural trauma of the Hazara people as opposed to other Afghans broadly who, despite it all, do face a lot of um, you know, violence, a lot of civilian deaths. However, the Hazaras are particularly situated in a very volatile situation. What impact does this have on the uh, cultural trauma and how does this impact young people from Hazara backgrounds, especially in diaspora? Thank you very much for inviting me to this event. And it's really an honor to be included and also with the other speakers, um, all of whom I, I know and respect their work very much. So I, I just want to um, say that. Um, so I am going to just uh, speak a little bit about my research. And um, I think that as, as I talk, the, the answers um, to your to your questions will will come out. Um, you know, I think that we're, we're also connected these days um, through social media and also through just our individual contacts and connections we have that all these different groups, the activists that I worked in Afghanistan with, um, as well as the diaspora groups and youth who have largely grown up outside of Afghanistan, they're all in conversation with each other. Um, although these kind of uh, way that these events are interpreted and processed happen differently 
in these different areas. Um, and yet again, you have this conversation happening with each other. Um, I, I, I'd like to just start out by talking about my entry to the field and um, it's, it's something that I've been thinking about quite a bit and it links uh, quite a bit to uh, Dr. Ibrahimi's um, discussion that he just made. When I first went to Bamiyan to do my research, I had some idea that I would uh, work on development, international development issues, and these sorts of things that I you know, think were quite popular to focus on in Afghanistan. And I think I learned pretty quickly that it's really important to listen closely to um, our interlocutors as social science scientists, that we have to hear what they're saying and uh, pay attention. And so, you know, issues of international development seem quite important to me, but people in the community that I worked with in Bamiyan just kept telling me over and over about um, stories from the Hazara past and present that were ongoing um, related to persecution of Hazaras and genocide of Hazaras. And so you know, after some time, I understood that if so many people were focusing on these issues in their conversations with me, which were supposed to be about development, then I'd be wise to shift my focus um, to that. I think um, the same can be said when we talk about the issue of genocide and whether or not there is, I mean, an ongoing genocide, a process of genocide happening um, right now. And this was something that also when I was doing the bulk of my research, which was in 2012, 2013. So it's been um, a few years now. Um, you know, I, I admit I wasn't fully convinced that this was the right way to describe what was happening to Hazaras. And I realize now that, in fact, this was hubris on my part um, as an outsider and as a social scientist, and that the people in Bamiyan who were telling me these things understood their situation um, perfectly well. And, um, you, you know, I, I do well to listen. And so this is you know, one thing that I'm really wanting to stress right now, we're hearing over and over again about the dangers that people are facing. Um, you know, we're talking about Daikundi at the moment, but that's not the only place or situation. And we've been hearing about it for years and um, we'd all do well to listen. So something that struck me, and I'll move on a little bit to the way that the um, collective or cultural trauma that was experienced by Hazara Zimbamian was shaped by the civil society activists I work with. Something that really struck me about the way that they talked about this was there was a sort of timelessness to their narrative. This is, this is another thing that I've been thinking through lately quite a bit. The trauma of Hazara's wasn't focused on one single event. Now, it was very clear to me that the Abdurrahman wars were kind of the anchor of all of this. So that, that I think was, was clear without question. This was a topic that everybody would always come back to when they were talking about Hazara persecution, Hazara trauma, and so on and so forth. Um, however, it was at the same time, something that was presented to me with a sort of timelessness. So the, 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 the persecution of Hazaras was linked to events in ancient history, not just earlier events um, in the history of Afghanistan, right? I mean, of course, we could talk about the fact that Hazara lands were being taken before Abdul Rahman's time and that, you know, so part of these problems were starting before and so on and so forth. But activists would talk to me about the loss of um, a culture that extended all the way back to the Silk Road era and a time when um, the central area of what is now Afghanistan, right, was known to be a, a place of tolerance and mixing of different peoples. And that this is what 
the the the, the cultural background of Hazar is really was right, um, and this had been lost. This was something that had been lost um, because of subsequent historical events. Of course, in Afghanistan, the trauma of Hazaras is also very closely related to that of Shia Muslims. Um, and I think that that needs to be noted and brought out as well. I think that that's maybe something that's a little bit different and not as notable among the diaspora. But given the social environment in Afghanistan, um, this was another, you could say, kind of ancient hook that that Hazaras carried with them. And the problems of Hazaras were linked to the problems of Shias. Not that they were seen as the same, right? Um, this wasn't, this isn't what I'm saying at all, but just that they were expressed using kind of a language that would be familiar to Shia Muslims anywhere in the world and using figures from Shia history to stand in kind of for figures of Hazara history, right? So Abdul Rahman is the same as Yazid in a way. They have the same face. And this was expressed to me quite clearly. But unfortunately, what I also found, right, was, I mean, when I'm talking about timelessness, I'm also talking about timelessness extending to the present and even the future, right? So these events would also be linked to what had happened in the recent history in Afghanistan, which I, I don't think I need to go into um too much right now, but also into a feeling that it was almost inevitable that there would be a return to these times of extreme loss. And, you know, while I was there, this seemed to be a way to say motivate people to act on behalf of the Hazara community to kind of come together, an effort to try to bring Hazaras together um, as a stronger political and social bloc that would seek certain types of change and uh, you know, demand more um, for the Hazara community as a whole. And so in that sense, you know, it could be thought of as somewhat empowering that it was um, not, not just you know, kind of weighing down the community with r repeated stories of trauma, because, you know, this, this is what the activists I work with did, right? They repeated again and again, these narratives, but trying to take that um, past of loss and of sorrow and turn it into something more positive. But then there was always this kind of asterisk by this, that this would return. Nobody wanted it to return, but it seemed to be um, really a strong belief that people had. And it's, it's hard looking at what's happening today because it seems that people were right, you know, that the activists I was working with were right. And that, you know, once again, I can say that you know, I can talk about this as a construction of, of trauma. And we can talk about um, kind of uh, patterns of, of social behavior and how this links into Shiism and so on and so forth. But really, I think um, what this also indicated, probably more so than the rest, is that uh, once again, these were people who knew perfectly well their situation, right? And they knew perfectly well, much earlier than outsiders did, right? That this, that, that where we've ended up now with the Taliban back in control and not putting Hazaras into any sort of position of power, completely excluding them from the government, or we have um, once again reports of ethnic cleansing that are going on. We have reports of Hazaras being killed, uh, sometimes in, in, in large numbers, again, going on, that, that, that they knew perfectly well that given, you know, what Afghanistan is, that this was very likely to happen. And we saw clues of it, I think, over the past months as attacks against Hazaras increased and increased. But, you know, people on the ground already knew that it was happening. Um, so the, the feeling of inevitability, um, it wasn't something that really should have been a surprise at all. I think if, if we'd, people like me, right, had been listening to those on the ground um, and seeing where this had come from. Now, you know, the question as to how this was felt by the diaspora, I, I work with in Greece, a very particular group of Hazara diaspora members, right? They, they have kind of a very uh, particular social reality, I think that it's probably, um, 
you know, very different from, you know, people who are in Australia or, you know, Canada or the United States or places like that. They are very much immersed in a world where there are many different refugees trying to get to Europe and who have kind of been blocked in Greece and can't get out. Um, they're not allowed to move on to other parts of Europe, which is what they would like to do, right? Because Greece um, is a very poor European country. It's not a place where there are many opportunities for work. Refugees from many places have had their um, applications for asylum in many stalled for many years. So, you know, I talk to people who have been there for 15, 20 years now who, who still don't have any sort of permanent status. And politically, they have found it um, quite necessary to link themselves together to these bigger issues that come up in Greece related to acceptance of refugees in general and um, kind of a no borders movement, um, a, a kind of far left no borders movement that that just really calls for the acceptance of, of people to all of Europe, right? Um, not, not to, you know, throw up these barriers to their integration um, and participation into society. So, you know, when I first met um, the Hazara refugees that I worked with in Greece, um, I wondered if I would kind of find a strong sense of particular Hazara identity that I had found when I was in Afghanistan. Um, and at first it seemed that I didn't, right? That, that um, the Hazaras in Greece tended to focus on, you know, kind of a shedding of identity and a, a demand that we, you know, not think about ethnicity and not think about nationality, but that rather we just, you know, kind of see each other all as human beings and um, provide op opportunities to people based on that. Um, and again, this was kind of a, a far leftist, no borders um, way of thinking about things and way of solving um, what, what is called a refugee crisis in Europe. I'm kind of skeptical of that term, but anyways. And yet after getting to know Hazaras in Greece, I found that something like an experience of, of past genocide and persecution that really is continuing to the present day and where there really is a deep concern that it might um, become worse in the future. It's not something that you can just kind of easily let go of. And so those Hazaras that I know in Greece, who, you know, again, talked really sincerely about kind of trying to shed it, shed these parts of their identities and tried to really, you know, kind of create this um, world in which, you know, everybody is just accepted based on their common humanity, were pulled back again and again by the past history of Hazaras and then the ongoing events that continue to happen in Afghanistan and not just in Afghanistan, I should say also in Pakistan um, and, and, you know, not leave out the experiences of um, Hazaras in, in Pakistan, which, you know, also been marked by um, instances of, you know, uh, targeting and, and suicide bombings, particularly in, you know, kind of the early tens. So we're never really able to leave this behind. And I think that that is also kind of a, a mark of this uh, collective trauma. It's a very real thing. And it, it, it pulls people back kind of again and again to these past events, um, even if they might be trying to actively move on to it and, 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 and live a different sort of life. Because how, how, how can you move, move beyond such a thing, especially when you see that in your homeland, it just keeps occurring again and again. Um, so there, there is this kind of, um, and I think, you know, when we, when we talk about individual trauma, you know, this is, this is one of the markers that, that, that comes up with individuals, right? That, you know, an event or something is experienced and then the individual is, is, is kind of pulled back again and again and reliving this event over and over again, um, whether it's through flashbacks or, or, or some sort of thing. And so, you know, this is one of the reasons that, because in a way, when we talk about collective trauma and, and 
you know, the trauma of a large group of people. It's, it's not quite a metaphor, but in some ways it, it is. I'm trying to show how it mirrors the, the psychological processes that, that individuals go through when they've gone through a traumatic event. Um, we see this with the um, collective pulling back again and again. And so this is something that I notice with the members of the diaspora that I work with. You know, I, again, I want to specify these were with a particular group of people in Greece, but I imagine that something similar happens to members of the Hazara diaspora all over the world, um, maybe experienced in slightly different ways, um, but that still this is what is happening. So um, I, I see that I'm almost out of time. I, I want to close, but you know, one of the last questions that was that was posed to me, and so I want to just you know really briefly touch on it, um, is there has been this backlash in Afghanistan and you know I'm sure in the diaspora as well by Afghans who do not identify as Hazara, right? Who uh, point their fingers at Hazaras and say, well, you're using these narratives of suffering and sorrow to try to um, get a better situation when really all Afghans have suffered and had sorrow. And so, you know, what kind of what makes you special and why do you think that um, you need to be focused on? Uh, it's certainly true that, you know, at this point, there's no community in Afghanistan that hasn't been through a, 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 a terrific amount of suffering. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I don't think that anyone is denying this. And I think that's, that, you know, that's the biggest point that I would make. I don't think that, you know, Hazaras are trying to say, you know, that other peoples in Afghanistan haven't suffered because of the wars. Nobody is saying that. But there's really something particular about what has happened to Hazaras with kind of very few, few exceptions and some small, very small minority communities there's really not another um, group in Afghanistan that is targeted for their ethnic and religious identity in the way that Hazaras have been. I, I could go a bit more into why I think that this is very clearly what's happening to Hazaras. I don't have time. I think, um, I, again, with this audience, you probably all have a pretty good idea. So asking that this be recognized, that the particular um, nature of the targeting and persecution be recognized as something that is being done because of ethnic and religious identity. I, I don't, um, you know, I, I, again, I don't think that this is denying what other people have gone through. And, you know, I think that it is um, something that is important to do to try to avoid that, you know, future where maybe these events might happen again. Um, you know, part of what Nehemiah said, and I think this is very important, is we have certain definitions of genocide in place also to try to prevent this from happening again. Um, so when we see even if, you know, a relatively small number of Hazaras at this point in this day have been, you know, killed in more recent events, it's not a reason to say, well, this isn't a problem or this isn't a big deal. Because if we know that these people are being targeted because of these aspects of their identity. And we know that there are people out there who want to continue to target them for this reason. We might be able to find a way to prevent um, what, you know, in the minds of many seems inevitable, but it really shouldn't be, you know? Um, and so when you have people who, you know, want to um, kind of deny the particularity of what is happening to the Hazara community. I really think that that is a sort of violence. It's um, something that we have you know, seen happen again and again. Um, it's kind of telling of Hazaras to kind of just be quiet. Everybody's having these problems, but you know, I don't, I don't think that we should stand for that at all. So um, I'll, I'll close there. And then um, if there's any questions, I can try to come back to anything and yeah. talk at more length. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Melissa. Thank you for giving us such a broad understanding of the different experiences that you've had and how that has impacted your research. It is really important uh, that you've pointed out that the Hazara identity is very multifaceted. We are not only targeted for being Hazara, but we have targets on our back as a result of being, a sh being Shia Muslims from being different parts of Afghanistan. Um, so thank you so much for that. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce um, an amazing speaker, an amazing researcher, and one, personally one of my favorite writers, uh, Dr. William Malley. 
Dr. William Malley is an Emeritus Professor of Diplomacy at Australian National University from 2003 to 2001 and was Foundation Director of the Asia-Pacific College of Diplomacy from 2003 to 2014. He is a Barrister of the High Court of Australia, Vice President of the Refugee Council of Australia, and a member of the Australian Committee of the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia-Pacific. Professor Maddy has written many books and research articles on Afghanistan and in particular the Hazara people. Thank you so much, Professor Maddy, for uh, accepting our invitation and uh, coming here tonight. I just wanted to um, get your perspectives on how the centralization of the government under King Abdurrahman Khan and the continuing centralization of government and power led to a deterioration of the situation for Hazara people because pre-centralization, Hazaras were thriving and how that how that has impacted in foreign powers, including British, the Soviet Union and the US being so involved in Afghanistan and how that this has been to the detriment of the Hazara people. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to share some thought uh, at this very important function. When we look at uh, genocide as a phenomenon, one of the uh, things that stands out is that it is uh, largely, perhaps not exclusively, but largely um, a phenomenon of state behaviour. Uh, and whilst the execution of genocidal behaviours is sometimes something which is disseminated or diversified, as we've seen in massive genocides of the 20th century, such as the Rwandan genocide and the, and the Cambodian genocide, nonetheless, um, having a driving force behind it is very often central to the dangers which the victims encounter. And that then raises immediate questions about the way in which the structure of the state can actually facilitate these kinds of uh, developments. Um, if one looks at the history of political thought, one of the things that's striking is that very different strands emerge. And one particular strand of thinking, which perhaps goes back to Plato, tends to um, venerate a political order in which people who are seen as virtuous are empowered to give effect to that virtue, the kind of philosopher king model of um, uh, the exercise of political power. Uh, a quite different approach, which is associated very much with the writings of the French scholar Montesquieu, um, focuses on the dangers of concentration of power. As Lord Acton famously said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So if one uh, goes down the pathway of seeking to find a great leader uh, who can uh, draw a society out of uh, penury and suffering to some brighter future, the danger is that one will end up empowering people to exercise power in a very destructive and, and murderous fashion. Uh, and thus, the uh, people who are associated with the kind of liberal approach that Montesquieu embodied emphasise the need to fragment power and put in place systems of checks and balances that can uh, interfere with the capacity of those who would want to be murderous because to some degree murderous behaviour requires a degree of coordination that can be difficult if proper checks and balances have been put in place. And in that sense, I think one can argue that the emergence of a strong central state, which many historians have attributed to the reign of Abdurrahman Hon from 1880 to 1901, actually set the scene for all sorts of disastrous consequences. And one only needs to read the historical works of Dr. Jonathan Lee, The Ancient Supremacy and His More Recent History of, of um, Afghanistan, to appreciate just how blood soaked uh, the reign of Amir Abdurrahman Khan actually was. For those who think that the solution to Afghanistan's problems in the 21st century is a kind of strong, centralised Hobbesian state, the events of the last two decades of the 19th century are an awful counterexample of what can flow uh, as a result of that. Uh, and that leads us, in a sense, into the 
challenge of genocide prevention. Uh, and um, there I'd just like to uh, add a couple of observations uh, which um, uh, are stimulated by the uh, very instructive comments that Dr. Ibrahimi uh, and Dr. Chirvenda made in their presentations. Um, but first, there are a couple of points I want to make about genocide more broadly, which I think are relevant to the times in which we're living. One is that uh, very often genocide is associated with systematic attempts to make secret what is going on. And that can come in many different forms. We know, for example, in respect of the Holocaust, that Heinrich Himmler gave a famous speech um, to uh, uh, Gauleiter in Nazi Germany in, in which he told them something glorious was happening which could never be disclosed. Very often secrecy uh, and suppression of media uh, go hand in hand with genocidal intent. Uh, and this is something of which one needs to be wary in the wider world. During the Cambodian gen genocide from 1975 to 1978, uh, most of the testimony uh, which showed what was happening at the time came from refugees who had crossed from Cambodia into Thailand and were in refugee camps in the vicinity of Aranya Pratet. And one of the most disturbing aspects of that particular period was the way in which in particular leftists in Western countries, set out to try to discredit the refugee narratives with uh, a line to the effect that what was being reported had not been adequately substantiated uh, and that refugees had an interest in playing up the uh, sorrows that might have been going on in their countries of origin and therefore couldn't be taken seriously. What became uh, agonizingly clear after the, the Vietnamese in, invasion of uh, uh, Cambodia in December 1978 that displaced the Khmer Rouge regime was that refugee accounts had been spot on uh, in identifying exactly what kind of horrors were being perpetrated in that particular environment. So uh, I have noticed with some concern that even people in the humanitarian sector in recent times have been seeking to undermine um, the credibility of some reports which are coming out about pretty nasty things happening uh, under the Taliban since uh, they took over large swathes of the country. And I think we need to be as wary of this as we might be of uh, claims that are yet to be fully substantiated because we know from past experience that horrible claims often are substantiated when the opportunity to gather more testimony um, uh, presents itself. The other general comment I'd like to make is that the wider world is not good at recognising genocidal activities when they're taking place. And here I'd make a personal observation. Uh, in 1994, uh, in May of that year, I was on a flight from London to Johannesburg to uh, work in as observer for the first multiracial election that was held in South Africa that saw Nelson Mandela become the, um, uh, the president. And the pathway of my flight with British Airways took me over Rwanda, where, as we know, a genocide of horrific uh, proportions was taking place with about 800,000 people massacred in a two-month period. Now, I would have to confess, I had no real awareness of what was going on in Rwanda at that time. And it was partly because I was, in no sense, a gory and gruesome detail about what had been happening. There were some reports, but not enough to capture global attention on the scale that what was occurring in Rwanda actually merited. And with a genuinely democratic regime based on mass participation, had so monopolised the reporting from Africa at the time that the truly dreadful events that were occurring in Rwanda received marginal attention. And it was only later that we actually learned in all the... We need to be wary of the same kind of thing happening in Afghanistan. Everyone will have noticed that attention has already begun to drift away from Afghanistan now that the airlift from Kabul airport uh, has, uh, uh, for the moment, been completed. Uh, and the danger is that uh, events that really should uh, uh, grip the conscience of humanity uh, will go unnoticed because other things come along that begin to pre preoccupy international observers. Uh, now, um, 
it's often said, if you go back to the 19th century, Karl Marx once said, history repeats itself as first time as tragedy and a second time as farce. But uh, we need to be alert to the possibility that history will repeat itself a first time as tragedy and a second time as tragedy and a third time as tragedy and so on. Uh, because very often there are um, antagonisms towards vulnerable groups that can resurface. And this is partly because social attitudes are to a very large extent learned rather than a product of direct personal experience. Um, and uh, this is where the phenomenon of historical memory is such an interesting one, really, because uh, um, so many uh, people uh, know about the history of their own peoples or their own communities without having been direct eyewitnesses to what's gone on. Um, and there is nothing particularly strange about this. And uh, when one uh, occasionally hears people saying that Hazara should get over what happened in the 19th century, it's worth noting that people in Virginia have not yet got over the Civil War. And we're seeing all sorts of disputation about the removal of Confederate statues uh, in parts of the United States at the moment, which show just how potent these learned senses of identity and identification actually can be. Uh, and there are also lessons that can be extracted from learned experiences of this kind as well, that there can be cautionary tales that flow from what's happened in the past. And one is that even if you put behind you a sense of victimhood from the past, that's no guarantee that historical persecutors will put aside themselves the sense that they have a right to lord it over some other groups that have historically been marginalised and rendered vulnerable in social environments. And, and that uh, uh, presages a, a need for a certain degree of caution. I want to conclude with a couple of observations about risk of genocide. Um, as um, Dr. Ibrahimi made clear in his uh, remarks, um, genocide is a, a process as well as simply an event, and it doesn't actually require an intent to eliminate a group in its totality, uh, that uh, an intent to eliminate in part also falls within the international legal definition of genocide. But what we do know is that there are certain risk factors that point to the uh, heightened danger of genocide or politicide, that is, killing of large numbers of people on the basis of political opinion rather than, than uh, ascriptive identity, uh, that should be taken into account. And here there are two that I'd simply mention in conclusion. One is a very important article that was written by Professor Barbara Half of the US Naval Academy in the American Political Science Review in 2003, entitled, No Lessons Learned from the Holocaust, Assessing Risks of Genocide and Political Mass Murder Since 1955. And this comprehensive study identified six factors that uh, proved to be potent predictors of the risk of mass um, atrocity killings in a society. Um, and very briefly, they were the following. First, the magnitude of prior political upheaval. Second, the experience of prior genocides or politicized. Thirdly, exclusionary elite ideology. Fourth, autocratic regime type. Fifth, an elite based mainly or entirely on an ethnic minority. Bear in mind that Afghanistan is a nation of minorities with no single group, meaning an absolute majority of the population. And finally, international interdependence in relatively low levels. What's alarming about that particular model is that Afghanistan at present ticks every single box. Uh, and that is one reason why in a separate uh, modelling project, the so-called Atrocity Forecasting Project uh, conducted by the Research School of Social Sciences at the Australian National University, uh, Afghanistan has been rated in the top five countries in the world at risk of genocide or politicide in the period from 2021 to 2023. The implication of this is that concern about genocide um, and politicide uh, amongst the Hazaras in Afghanistan is not um, simply a product of uh, an undue preoccupation with historical experience. It's an apprehension which is actually grounded in very solid social science research of a comparative dimension uh, and which therefore 
should serve as a warning to all of us that uh, the past, in all its uh, grisly and gruesome particulars, is at risk of being repeated in Afghanistan at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Manley, for that wonderful overview of the situation and the trajectory of the, you know, of the heinous acts that are happening in Afghanistan. I hadn't heard the the research that you um, mentioned about the impact and, you know, the very imminent threat of a genocide happening within the next few years. And as a young Hazara, that breaks my heart because my parents lived through an imminent genocide in the 1980s. I am sure that many of my ancestors lived through the genocide in 1890s. And it breaks my heart even more knowing that I probably will live through, hopefully not, but live through some part of a genocide and maybe my kids even will go through that. Um, so thank you so much for that. And thank you to all our fantastic speakers for all the insights, information, lived experience and knowledge that you shared today. It has been a fantastic conversation and it is pivotal that we continue to keep Afghanistan in the spotlight. And in particular, that the Hazara people of Afghanistan who face a very detrimental future as a result of the Taliban takeover. This brings us to the close of the panel discussion. And now I will pass on to Reza Nasri who will moderate our Q&A. Thank you, everyone. First of all, I want to uh, thank Professor William Maley, Ustad Gulzari, um, Professor Melissa, and uh, Dr. Ibrahimi for their work uh, on the Hazara history and uh, for raising awareness about the Hazara people. Definitely, your works, uh, your books, and articles were one of the main source of inspiration for our team in Sabah and Suwas to organize this event. Um, in order to cover all the questions, so we have only three minutes, unfortunately. So for each question, we are going to assign only three minutes. So the first question is uh, from uh, Professor William Maley, as they didn't uh, mention the name of the speaker. So I, I want to ask it from Professor William Maley. Uh, what is the reason that many non-Hazaras do not recognize the genocide of the Hazara people in Afghanistan? To some degree, that's a speculative matter. One um, doesn't necessarily have a great deal of uh, direct evidence on that. But I would say that if you look at uh, experiences of mass atrocity crime elsewhere, um, uh, there are two factors which can come into play. One is um, that people who are not within a community that has been victims of genocide are rarely brought up with an understanding of what might have happened to people who were victims of genocide. Very often, uh, the process of learning within a family may not expose people to a sense uh, of what atrocities may have been committed in the past. Uh, and I've actually heard uh, people in countries other than Afghanistan uh, who uh, have really been shocked when they've learned about past atrocities committed in the histories of their own countries because they simply weren't told about that when they were growing up and it didn't figure in school curricula and things of that sort. Um, so that's one side of the um, uh, the coin in, in explaining a, a sort of a, a, a lack of uh, willingness to accept things. The other side of the coin, I suppose, is that the sense that people can sometimes have about the idea of responsibility is that one is responsible for one's own actions and therefore is not responsible for what may have been done by earlier generations, even if they happen to be members of the same community. Uh, Edmund Burke in 1775, in his speech on reconciliation with the colonies, uh, said, I do not know how one can uh, craft an indictment of an entire people. And I think that comes into play here too, that uh, one needs to be careful about the extent to which historical um, uh, culpability can be attributed to people of a current generation simply by virtue of their being descendants of others. And that often can inf affect in turn people's own sense of where historical responsibility lies. So we've actually seen that in Australia in the context of discussion about an apology to um, uh, the Indigenous peoples for past suffering. So it's a complex kind of issue, but I think that can feed into the discussion as well. Thank you, Professor. Uh, next question is uh, from Mr. Gulzari. Uh, why do you think the Abdurrahman government were so 
defiant to desperate to keep the Hazara people out of power? Uh, unfortunately, uh, the Hazaras actually from the Amir Sher Ali Khan period, the and uh, particularly in that part time, political situation of the Afghanistan was very volatile. The Hazaras were actually in the support of Amir Sher Ali Khan, and that's why the Amir Abdul Rahman Khan was uh, had in mind that because he had a great rivalry with his uncle Amir Sher Ali Khan. And there was another, all other elements as well that Amir Abdurrahman Khan never, I mean, uh, I mean, was not will, uh, not willingly. I mean, even he was his intention was not to to, to uh, involve Hazaras or uh, in his power or just to even welcome them in, in his power. Because when he was uh, uh, had in some expeditions in the other parts of Afghanistan, like uh, against the Shinwaris and against the Sakhan revolt. Uh, revolt so uh, he used uh, uh, lots of Hazaras from the Daizingi and Daikundi area, their meals. They went and submit to Abdurrahman Khan. And they when they paid tributes for many years, but some part of the Hazarasan, which is called Yaghistan, are the independent Hazaras of Uruzgan, another part of that, of that part. Mm, they, they were remain independent and they were, they thought they are remain independent and they were, they did not uh, pay tribute to uh, Kabul uh, and, uh, authorities. But Amir Abdurrahman Khan's intention was, the documents shows that his intention and his what was in his mind was a sort of uh, old like uh, rivalry or they were against the position changing of the Hazaras sometime with the other uh, mm, ruler. Uh, but I think it's my belief and uh, maybe I'm, uh, it needs further uh, <clears throat> investigation on, from my side that the Abdurrahman was uh, thinking that the Hazara is uh, the supporter of Sherli Khan. And that's why on gradually when he tried to, to get Hazara on his side, but he was a bit doubtful, maybe the Russians and the Iran's or Persian um, uh, people, Persian mullahs and other, they are also investigating uh, Hazaras against uh, him. That's the mind mm. part, actually. Thank you, Mr. Guzari. Next question is, uh, I want to ask it uh, from Dr. Melissa. We are in a different situation and a different time. Don't you think emphasizing on the Hazar genocide will increase division and ethnic conflict in Afghanistan? So shortly, I, I, I no, I don't, I don't uh, think that that at all. I don't, I don't think that um, the 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 reason for what can be interpreted as ethnic conflict in Afghanistan or, or tensions say better um, is, is, is because, you know, Hazaras are trying to bring attention to these matters. Um, I think that, you know, there, there are historical reasons um, that, um, you know, I think have been gone into There are historical power structures that, that exist that um, are, really the reason that 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 we see these issues um reoccurring again and again so i i don't i don't see that um in in any way that hazar is trying to bring attention to this as is is worsening the situation um you know again i think that that people who who say this are um you know those who uh, perhaps feel they have something to lose or they you know are used to seeing a, a social reality in which, you know, other people who, who are not Hazaras are the ones who hold positions of power. And so when they kind of see an assertion on the part of Hazaras, it's um, uncomfortable and, and uncanny. And, um, you know, this, we, we, I think that, that we can see direct parallels to relations that have been happening in the United States as an American, I see quite clearly parallels between, you know, the way that this is talked to about in Afghanistan and the way that people talk about like the Black Lives Matter movement and other things happening in the United States. It's quite absurd to say that, you know, it's it's the the, the people who have been excluded who are now the ones who are bringing these problems upon themselves. I don't think that's the case at all. So thank you for your response. And the uh, next question, I want to ask it from, from Mr. Gulzari and even uh, Mr. Ibrahimi, you can both uh, have your response in this 
uh, question. So uh, what percentage of the land of the Hazara people forcefully uh, grabbed? And uh, there are several opinions about the number of the Hazara Hazaras being massacred, displaced, or uh, taken as slaves. But on what ground the number 62% is used? Actually, this is one of the one of the important questions which has always been asked from me and even I asked my from myself uh, which source and uh, which credible source says that the 60% or 62% or 65% of the Hazara has been massacred during the uh, reign of Amir Abdurrahman Khan and onward. But uh, unfortunately, I haven't come across uh, such a concrete evidence unless I can quote the volume fourth of the Siraj Tawarikh of Faiz Muhammad Khatib, which has been pro probably written in on, uh, during uh, completed in 1925 or 93. I don't know very much about that, but the book I have went through thoroughly. He mentions uh, about 13, repeatedly in 13 places, in four volumes, that the number he repeated saying about the 400,000 uh, families. Yani, I, I just version which he's mentioned the exact Char Sat Hazar Khanaware Hazaraha. 400,000 families of Hazaras either migrated, imprisoned, are killed or tortured or vanished from the Hazaraja. This is the <clears throat> one of the sol solid and concrete number which Faiz Muhammad Khatib uh, gives us, which uh, I uh, rely on that very much. The other perspectives the people are quoting is maybe they refer to the Temur, <clears throat> Temur Khanov's book, which has been written some 40, 40, 30, 40, 40 years ago. But probably, I think, some of the people, they uh, refer it because the Besut Hazara and some part of the Orozgan, after the fall of Orozgan and after defeat, uh, Mir Muhammad Hussein Beg, who met the uh, Major General James Brown in 11th April 19, 1894, he, in his statement, he explains and uh, how many how many percent of the uh, population in the Zauli and Sir Zauli and other part of the world has gone. They were uh, killed or they were removed or whatever they, they vanished. Their percentage comes very close to the sixty percent or sixty five percent. But I think the people refers to that probably. But as a whole, sixty and sixty five percent. Um, at least I myself, I haven't come across that where that has been mentioned from which source, uh, which credible source has uh, uh, quoted that. I, I really don't know about that very much. If you have anything, so please come on. Well, I just would like to uh, follow up from Mr. Guntari. I think this has been really one of the most complex questions for us to answer. answer. Yeah, uh, yes, know, exactly. The True. reason is because this is 19th century Afghanistan. Right. Having I mean, today, we don't mm. have any accurate, reliable data on the population of Afghanistan and how many of them are Hazaras and other ethnic groups. Right. So, how can we base our estimate on the population of the Hazaras in the 19th century? And then, also more importantly, in the context of war and violence of that period, we also come to a conclusion how many of those people were exterminated. I think you know mm. there is no reliable figure uh, source. I have come. I tried myself very hard. Uh, I think there are estimates used uh, by Faiz Muhammad Khatib Hazara of a specific groups. For example, the Besudis uh, in the present day Wardak province. How many percentage of them were exterminated uh, during the war and violence? True. And more broadly speaking, I think you know the most affected part of Hazara Jiyad, or Hazara land, during those years was the area that became known as Yaghistan, Yaghi land, you know, which is itself a very sort of loaded historical term, right? Because in my book, I try to, you know, 
And the challenge is this assumption that the Hazaras were necessarily a rebellious community that was always keen, determined to oppose any central authority. Uh, because the historical evidence clearly shows that that was not the case. So that Hazara has a yogi areas. It, it consisted of you know, mainly Oruzgan, you know, what is part of Zabul now, uh, and some areas in north of Kandahar and Hilmat. Uh, and Ajuristan was part of that area. Uh, what we know is that most of those areas were completely taken over in the course of the conflict uh, between 1891 to 1893, and they were redistributed to new settlers who are predominantly Pashuks, right? So as a result, the Hazaras lost the most fertile, agriculturally productive part of their homeland. Uruzgan, uh, uh, and Zabul, North of Kandahar, and part of Ghazni province as well now. Uh, and another, I think, difficult uh, uh, thing is also to what extent how we define the Hazaras. I mean, do you include the Sunni Hazaras as part of the Shia Hazaras as well? I mean, there were some Sunni Hazaras who were affected, but there were others who were not affected in, in, during that, uh, the violence of that period. So I think, you know, when we look into account, uh, another aspect to look at is also whether how many people were uh, affected during those three years and how many people died subsequently as a result of the conditions in which the Hazaras found themselves. For example, there was a cholera outbreak in 1893, 1894, I think, uh, that was responsible for the death of a lot, a very large number of people, and a very large number of people fled uh, Afghanistan. So in, in addition to those sources, I think uh, there's one uh, figure uh, which uh, is uh, suggested by Jonathan Lee in his most recent book, Afghanistan History, I think uh, from, uh, from 12th century to the present. Uh, I don't remember the title, but you can search it up. He suggests that 50% of the male population of the Hazaras were killed, exterminated. Mm. So again, I think, you know, how do you come to that figure? I think there's a lot of difficulties with the data, uh, the sources that we can, uh, can, can use. Uh, and I, and I, I suspect we may never be able to come to a conclusion, but we can uh, look at all of these various sources to, you know, reasonably accurately claim that a very large percentage of the Hazara population were exterminated, either to violent conflict during those three years or as a result of mass displacement, slavery, and uh, disease uh, that came in Hazara um, in the following years. Thank you so much. Uh, can, I, can I add uh, uh, only for 30 seconds one thing, that the, yes. uh, the one of the important area of the uh, replacement are the immig uh, forced immig uh, immigrated Hazaras were the Sunnis Hazaras Kalaino, because I, uh, the, uh, there was a, the plenty of the um, first hand source uh, shows that the, 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 during the Afghan Boundary Commission, the Colonel Ridgeway and the C, uh, Colonel C8, these people were when they were on surveying the, on the Russia Afghan uh, uh, frontiers, they had extensive survey of about, the, about the, all these uh, community on that area, and, uh, they were called uh, Turkic races. And the, that time, on one of the report of CEA, it recommends that the, these people, particularly when the Colonel Ridgeway visited the Hazara chiefs in the Kaleno, and he explains in the detail that how powerful these people are. Even they had their own independent flags and with, with a complete army, but they are also considered in his report that these people, non-Turkic people in this area, uh, may cause for the uh, may uh, their leniency are with the Russians and may cause if the Russian uh, comes uh, to the India or attack, they probably use this area and mm. that's why these people should be replaced and moved from here. And uh, and by the when the war was uh, in its height in Warusgan area, but at the same time the Hazaras the Sunnis were uh, also I mean. I was um, uh, and, uh, uh, against Abdurrahman was revolted in the Kalaino and the Hazaras were forcefully removed from the Kalaino and they were uh, uh, actually emigrated in the other part of the Afghanistan, even in the Khurasan. Mm, right. Thank you very much. Thank Could I make so one much. quick point on this too? Yes, go ahead. Um, 
if we should not get hung up about precise statistics, and I agree entirely with Dr. Ibrahimi uh, in talking about the difficulty of gathering data from the remote past, a figure we hear quoted all the time uh, is that 6 million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. Now, it's uh, it, highly unlikely that it was a round figure just like that. But there's nothing mm. that one learns mm. historically by suggesting that it might have been 5.8 million rather than 6 million. The, the commandant of the Auschwitz concentration camp at the Nuremberg trials admitted in testimony that over 2 million people had been gassed while he was the commandant. Under those circumstances, mm. the kind of Holocaust denial literature that tries to discredit individual points of detail and entirely misses the horror of what actually happened uh, is tremendously dangerous to historical understanding. Historical understanding is not actually produced by getting every single statistic right. It arises through appreciating the moral implications of dreadful events. Thank you so much for that. And uh, also, I want to ask uh, this question again from uh, uh, Professor William Maley. Uh, what is uh, your um, opinion on the uh, trajectory that Afghanistan is on right now and uh, the consequences of this uh, for the minority groups in Afghanistan? This is a huge question. I think the situation briefly is very alarming at the moment because uh, the international community has, uh, in effect, collaborated in the uh, regeneration of a tyrannical regime within Afghanistan, which shows no signs of having changed in any meaningful fashion from the kind of regime that it represented between uh, 1996 and 2001. And for that reason, I think uh, both that uh, uh, ethnic minorities but also other confessional minorities, vulnerable groups such as women, all have tremendous concerns about what's going on at the moment. And it's incumbent upon actors in the wider world not to be seduced by rhetoric about Taliban 2.0 and that kind of thing, and instead to do everything possible to focus international attention on what is crystallising in uh, Afghanistan at the moment, because we know that the attention span of the wider world is uh, limited, and that means that the responsibilities of those those of us who are in a position to highlight these problems are greater than ever. Thank you so much. And uh, next question, I want to ask it uh, from um, uh, Dr. Ibrahimi. Uh, what projection would legal uh, recognition of Hazara genocide uh, result into under a Taliban government who are continuing to carry out the fatwa of Abdul Rahman in 2021? Uh, well, I think the recognition uh, of the Hazara genocide is quite uh, an important one, uh, both in Afghanistan but also internationally. I think we have covered it quite a bit during this webinar, how challenging and difficult it has been for, the, uh, for it to be recognized in Afghanistan. I think uh, there is a great deal of... Um, uh, you know, uh, denial going on there uh, for reasons of history, uh, for reasons of political interests of different groups in Afghanistan. And I suspect it, and I believe uh, it is highly unlikely that we will be in a position anytime soon that you know, the government and the Taliban will move to recognize this past history of injustices and genocide against the Hazaras. Um, you know, partially because there are many members of the movement itself who are implicated in the uh, genocide and killing of the Hazaras in Mazar -e Sharif, for example, in August 1998. Some of them are now in high positions of power in Afghanistan and Kabul at the moment. So I think it is not only for the Taliban a matter of history, but it's also a matter of the legitimacy and credibility of their leading figures who are implicated in those sorts of events. Then internationally, I think there is a lot of effort. I think, uh, but I think we need much more of that. Uh, there has to be uh, an increased awareness and recognition of the genocide. It is history that was directed towards the Hazaras around the world. I think examples can be seen from other similar genocides. The Armenian genocide, for example, is the God recognition. Uh, in, in some parts of the world, uh, in, in the US, I think. So I think you know, some of those moves can potentially increase uh, 
international attention to the vulnerability of the Hazaras now, but I believe there will also be a lot of uh, sort of denialist uh, attempt by other groups as well, uh, and also some international uh, actors will also try to downplay those sort of risks mm-hmm. for the reasons we have already covered in the subject. So in this seminar, so I think you know, there is a lot of need for increased uh, events like this, uh, for uh, more documented, uh, uh, you know, analytical history of Afghanistan uh, to show and in, and, uh, and analyze different aspects of it. You know, I think you know, given it is scale, uh, I think uh, you know, this this is, is this particular you know events of the Jihad of the Hazaras is also one of the least understood in Afghanistan, if you compare it in terms of number, uh, if it's impact on one community, you, you can see comparison in parallel with a lot of other similar events that have affected other communities around the world. But there's very, very little discussion of what's happening right now in both academic circles, but also in more public and uh, media uh, discussions as well. Thank you, Dr. Brahimi. And- uh, we received a lot of questions, and unfortunately, we are running out of time. So I want to ask the last question from uh, uh, Aqai uh, Gulzari. So, Mr. Gulzari, is there any evidence uh, that shows that Iranian mujtahids or mullahs had influence on the Hazara people, specifically during uh, Abdul Rahman? I, I think you mentioned something about it. Uh, was there any evidence? I have actually investigated this question, either the Mujtahid of Mashhad of that time, particularly which has been blamed by, Ab- by Abdurrahman Khan and has been mentioned by Hassan Kakar in his book, The Pacification of Hazaras. Uh, I specifically followed that case and extensively I investigated and I have, uh, uh, I have uh, retrieved all the original materials which has been referred by Hassan Kakar and all the 13 enclosures that has been exchanged between the, the three governments, Afghanistan, British India and uh, Persia. And I have traveled Mashhad as well and uh, viewed all the records of the Sheikh Muhammad Taqi. I went to his library and even the Asani Qutsi Razavi as well. But uh, there was a lots of uh, interesting uh, thing was there. But Sheikh Muhammad Taqi Bijnurdi, along with his other uh, junior mullahs who were uh, the part of the Reji or the Tobacco movement, which has been finished at that time, and they joined him actually. And they all uh, had the, uh, I mean, raised the issue of the Hazara killing in, in Mashhad. By their influence, they actually influenced the Shah of Iran. Uh, and they also threatened the uh, Amir Abdurrahman Khan as well. If we, uh, actually, they actually did their threat went through the Shah of Iran to the Amir Abdurrahman Khan. This is all explained in the three in, uh, 13 enclosures. But the Mujtahid of Mashhad, uh, I haven't found any evidence that Mujtahid of Mashhad, Sheikh Muhammad Taqi, and uh, the, his uh, followers and his friends and colleagues, they uh, had not actually influenced inside Afghanistan. But the uh, refugees in, uh, in Mashhad around in Khurasan, Yes, he had, uh, he quelled, and on a several occasions, even the Hazaras has started march uh, from Mashhad to Tehran. And in one of the telegram, um, uh, the Shah of Iran requested British uh, government to please, I mean, stop Abdurrahman Khan to, uh, uh, I mean, the atrocities against the Shias. Otherwise, the refugees from Afghanistan has started march to come to the Tehran, which makes a uh, big trouble for us because that part of the Khorasan was under the uh, was uh, to some extent was under British and Russian controls. So this was a very extensive thing. But the, one of the major blame which uh, which uh, accusation comes that the Sheikh Muhammad Taqi has issued fitwa against the Sunnis of uh, uh, Afghanistan and declared war like that. But unfortunately, the real document says that he threatened and he was intended, and this was the world. But this is the these are the different words. But unfortunately, uh, until now, my my work and the uh, the original source he explains that Sheikh Muhammad Taqi never uh, issued fitwa because one of the reasons at that time the senior uh, Grand Ayatollah. Um, uh, Sheikh uh, Muhammad Shirazi, who declared uh, uh, tobacco uh, haram or a fitwa against the tobacco of the Reja Company in, 
in Khurasan. He was alive at that time. Uh, in the presence of the Grand Ayatollah, the Junior Ayatollah, uh, they may have no power to uh, issue a decree of the infidelity against uh, uh, Muslim brothers like that. That's, that's very rare. I have never seen like that. But when I was discussing this with the, 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 the family members of the Sheikh Omar Taqi, they also said we, we don't have such a, uh, evidence. And he showed me lots of documents about him. Uh, but this is a very big discussion, which I have accumulated all this information. So this is not the time for that to discuss. But anyway, the Shaykh Muhammad Taqi had influence on the refugees of the Mashhad, where the Hazaras and other Haratis and other Shias uh, were, were around him. And he was facilitating him because they were refugee. And even he requested from Asani Qudsi Rizvi on 50 applications to provide them sustenance, food and relief packages. That, that was the thing which... Until now, I have accumulated. Thank you so much. Thank you all. This is the end of um, Q&A session. I want to thank all of you guys uh, for participating. And uh, thank you to our honorable guests for attending. And thank you for your time. This brings us to the official close of our panel discussion and Q&A. Thank you all so much for joining us on this amazing and informative session. Thank you for standing in solidarity and as allies with the Hazara people, as we mourn, commemorate and advocate for a better Afghanistan and a better situation for the Hazara people. A special thank you to our four esteemed speakers. It was a fantastic panel and we, we, we hope that we had more time, but unfortunately we couldn't get to all of your questions. We apologize for that. From us on behalf of Sabah and Swas, we thank you all for being here and we hope you have a wonderful evening, morning or afternoon, wherever you are joining us from. And we hope you stay safe during such tumultuous situation. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.